And uh, welcome, welcome to everyone. Such nice attendance. We have friends from Cape Town, Holocaust and Genocide Center. I see Linda Hector and Ursula and many others. I see friends from Durban and the Holocaust Center there. I see friends from Holocaust Centers in London and uh, from around the world in, uh, uh, I see Glenn Timmermans, Dinke Hondius from the Anne Frank Air House in Amsterdam, uh, uh, Jan Eric Duberman, our friend, and many, many other friends. And uh, of course, our dear Holocaust survivors that always join us uh, in our weekly webinars. Uh, friends, it is wonderful to see you. And, um, Tonight is special because behind the scenes, uh, we are doing quite a lot of uh, films and resources, writing papers, doing so much. And a lot of what we're doing is with our volunteers. In the center, we are only about 11 staff members, but we have over a hundred volunteers. And one of those volunteers is Pam Mayer-Roberts, who gave up of her time to create a short film that we can use in our education department. And why do we do these short films? And why and how do we do the process of creating these resources? It is because we have a very large archive. We started recording and interviewing survivors and righteous amongst the nations many, many years ago. In our archives, we have dozens and dozens of interviews and many of them just stay in the archive. They are just for research and for, uh, for just our knowledge uh, of the topic. But what we are trying to do is to create educational resources from the archive. And that is when Pam came along and said, I'm willing to, to give it a go in my spare time. And I will introduce Pam in a few minutes to tell you why she came and decided to take this task of creating the film that you will see today. Um, Today, we will also look at what we always do and how we always teach the topic of the Holocaust and of genocide. We always look at human behavior. We always look at choices, at dilemmas, at different choices of different people, communities, governments, and uh, we unpack it. We look at gray areas in between them. And what we try to do is to look at different case studies. In our permanent exhibition, one of the case studies that we look at is the choices in the Netherlands. And this is what we are going to do with you tonight. Let me tell you a little bit uh, about uh, the, the Nazi occupation in the Netherlands, just that we will all understand and all be in the same sort of level of understanding of that complex history. After the German invasion of the Netherlands in May 1940, a civil administration was installed under the SS with Arthur Seiss Inquart as the Reich Kommissar. The Germans perceived the Dutch as racially Aryan with a similar culture and language to themselves. 50,000 Dutch volunteered for the Waffen SS and were organized into two SS divisions. They fought many battles alongside the Germans, including the siege of Leningrad. Some were involved in atrocities and the murder of Jews in the East. This part of history is less known. What is known more is the uh, occupation power treatment of the Jews. 
But during 1940, the German occupation banned Jews from the civil service and required them to register their business assets. In January of 1941, the German required all Jews to register, register as Jews. And the registration shows a total of 159,806 persons who registered. And that is including almost 20,000 people born of mixed marriages and around 25,000 Jewish refugees from the German Reich, from Germany, from Austria, and from what used to be Czechoslovakia. About 4,000 of these Jews who lived in the Netherlands were descendants of Spanish and Portuguese Jews who escaped Spain and Portugal in the 15th and 16th century during the Inquisition. A Jewish council was established in February 1941. Yap van Prusnik, that we will learn about today, tried to save Jews through the administration but also through pretending their way of Spanish or Portuguese descent and thus Christians for hundreds of years. And you will see how he did that. After the arrest of a few hundred young Jews who were then sent to Buchenwald and to Mount Housing concentration camps, um, there was a general strike uh, of Dutch workers on the 25th of February, 1941. But the Germans brutally suppressed the strike and Nazi policy uh, became much hardened towards the Jews. The Germans and the Dutch collaborators segregated Jews from the ge general Dutch population and sent 15,000 Jews to forced labor camps. The Germans then ordered the uh, concentration of Jews in Amsterdam and sent foreign and stateless Jews to the Westerbork transit camp in the northeast part of the country. We will see that Yap also visited Westerbork uh, almost on a weekly basis. Some of the remaining provincial Jews were sent to the Vught, uh, Vught camp. And as of the 29th of April, 1942, Jews were required to wear the yellow star on their clothing. The deportation of Jews from the Netherlands began in the summer of 1942, and the last train left Westerbork for Auschwitz on the 3rd of September, 1944. During those two years of deportations, the Germans and the Dutch collaborators deported about 107,000 Jews, mostly to Sobibor and Auschwitz killing centers where they were murdered. Only 5,200 of them survived. In addition, 25,000 to 30,000 Jews went into hiding. They were assisted by the Dutch underground, by the Dutch resistance. Two thirds of those Dutch Jews who went into hiding though, managed to survive while others were betrayed or found, of course, the most famous is Anne Frank and her family. Yad Vashem recognized 5,821 Dutch citizens as righteous amongst the nations as of January of 2020, and one of them uh, was Yap van Pusti. The geography, of course, of the Netherlands, this flat land, this water bogged land, made escape very difficult and uh, of also the ruthless efficiency of the German administration and the willing cooperation of the Dutch co collaboration, um, uh, collaborators and uh, the police, the administration and so on, doomed the Jews of the Netherlands um, to their very, very uh, uh, tragic fate. So less than 25% of Dutch Jewry survived the Holocaust. Now I gave this uh, context because the film really, it's a nine minutes film that really just is based on an interview done in 2009 
with Yap. Yap lived in Pretoria after the war, and uh, you will learn more about his life. We will watch the film, and then I will have a discussion with the director, Pam May Roberts. And after that, uh, um, Tuli and Rene Posniak from our education team will look at choices in the Netherlands through some other stories, especially of survivors that settled in South Africa. And then we will open for a Q&A with you, the audience. So I encourage you to uh, write your, uh, your comments or your, your questions in the chat box. I'm going now to try and share my screen. We did have some technical problems. I hope we will not have any such problems. And I am going to share it now. We will watch the film. My grandfather was a reformed dominee, uh, so we were reformed in those days, the Calvinists. I emigrated to South Africa in '47. I was married by that time, and uh, I'm still here. I practice as an attorney. I feel in Afrikaans, I have a beroep that is a roeping. I'm called to do that. And that's why I automatically help people without thinking about it. it it's, it's a sort of a habit which I inherited from my father. I remember we, we woke up one morning and heard uh, planes and went to the radio and heard that the Germans were bombing uh, the coast in Holland. Uh, three days later or so, they threatened to bomb Rotterdam flat. And that was it, and we saw the Germans coming in. Then the Nuremberg laws were applied to Holland, uh, and all the Jewish people had to be dismissed. Shortly after that, they said the Jews must go to Germany to work there. Before that, had to declare themselves as Jews. Now the administration the, of the people in, in Holland was very exact. And they had a register called the uh, Bevolkingsregister. There were some cases where it was not quite sure whether someone was a Jew or not. And so the Reichskommissar, he decided someone, some German, should supervise the decisions uh, of the interior ministry. And he appointed a certain Dr. Kalmeyer, he was an advocate in Germany, he was not a Nazi, luckily enough. So the, the Kalmeyer made a list of, had a list made of all the Portuguese Jews that was called the Jewish list. And there was another list, a huge list of uh, non-Portuguese who also for some reason applied for and that was called the Kalmeyer list. Now after a while the SS was complaining and they put some pressure on Kalmeyer that the list should be shortened. So Kalmeyer asked me whether I was prepared to do that and I said to him, uh, I must say I don't agree with what you do with the Jews, but I'm an advocate and I do according to my profession. So long as it is not against my conscience, I will professionally am prepared to help you. I got a room there in the department and I had access to all his files. I copied the stamps on letters and this signature or initials of that Dutch assistant and after 
two or three weeks I got a list from Amsterdam and I went to Kalme and set up Kalme. I went through all the files and there are quite a few that are not sufficient Portuguese. And here is a list. This list was suddenly a few hundred shorter. We had many uh, people coming to us trying to prove that they were not Jews. I remember <laughs> my first case which I tried uh, was a, a young girl of say four or five years. She was Jewish. I went to call me and he looked at it and said, no, that's not a good case. I dismiss it. I can't remember why I did it. I said to him, you are just like Herodes. He also killed children. <laughs> and he was shocked, of course. Uh, he didn't expect such a reply. A little bit later, there was a decision signed by Karl Mayer, by us, and, uh, and she was safe. Now, after a while, there was pressure on Karl Mayer again. Uh, some Jews who were already in Westerberg had been declared non-Jews, and they looked very much like Jews. So the SS started saying that all the cases should be re-investigated, and so he, he got some trouble there. Then he said, you know, it would be a good thing if before I decide on a case that uh, I ask the Westerbork commandant for his comment. Uh, would you prepare to go for me to Westerbark? Because he didn't like to have any direct business with the SS. They, the, he hated the SS. Then they had uh, a sort of a office for Jewish assistance there. That was a German Jew, Dr. Ottenstein. Very good. We had a very good relationship. We called the person in question, uh, briefed them what was happening, and then the next morning I went to Gemmerker and the people came there one at a time and he dictated to his secretary his comments. And I went there more or less every second week for almost a year. There are lots of cases, of course. The one was a girl uh, of, say, three years old or so with her mother and the girl was blonde. Gemmerker was impressed. He was absolutely sure that she was not a Jew. The mother handed over the child to someone who would look after the child. Next week the mother was gone. After the war, my partner went to Kalme. He was in jail then and told him that uh, we had cheated. And Kalme said, yes, I can believe it of you, but from pros they never cheated. I don't know why. Shalom, Shalom, 
All right, so I would like now to introduce Pam Merovitz to you. As I said to you, Pam was a volunteer that took archival material of a three hour interview with Jaap van Prusdijk two years before he passed away and created this educational film that we are using for our educational purposes. Who is Pam? Pam runs her own video editing company called uh, Meticulture. And uh, she has honors degree in industrial psychology and has worked in broad spectrum of industries, uh, moved from one industry to another, but always had passion for film and for creating films. Um, she, uh, after, after taking a break uh, from work, because she has a lovely family and three lovely daughters, um, she returned uh, to hone her skills uh, in video editing. Over the past three years, she has worked on exciting projects, including corporate videos, documentaries, event broadcasting, and webinar productions. She approaches each task meticulously with analytical mind and believes that every creative solution needs to be backed by a sound strategic intention. And uh, it was really an honor, Pam, to work with you on the film. And uh, I would love to now ask you um, to unmute yourself. Yeah. And, uh, Thank and, you, Tony. And uh, come, um, come forward. Um, Pam, maybe can you take us a, a little bit behind the scenes uh, of making of this short film. What was the process like? Uh, who did you work with? How did you choose and, you know, and include the archive material, for example, uh, in the film? So just take us behind the scene of the making of this little film. Sure. Uh, firstly, thank you, um, uh, Talia, a massive thank you for once again, including me on your panel. And this is the second time we've had an opportunity to show Yop's uh, beautiful movie. And it really, from the outset, was such an honor and a privilege to have been brought in and to work on this, this wonderful movie. So thank you for that. Um, as you said, uh, Yop's, Yop's um, footage was lying dormant in your archives for many, many years, over 10 years. And um, you entrusted me to really take the footage out and um, to create or bring his story back to life. So it was really such an honor and a privilege. And I think people will appreciate after seeing the movie and the incredible person that he was, uh, the brave and heroic work that he did, that he truly deserved to be acknowledged and, and honored in such a manner and not still be in, in your archives. Um, so yes, Tali, we, we work very closely together on this project, thankfully, and together with Sean O'Sullivan, the two of you brought such incredible guidance for me and uh, such rich knowledge from both the historic point of view, point of view your, your detailed historic knowledge is, is incredible as you um, showcased us in the beginning of the film. And um, Sean also incredible documentary history and, and knowledge and uh, it, it was really such a wonderful learning ground for me to have been exposed to both of you and to work with you on the project. Um, just in terms of the process, you did mention that it was three hours of footage that we had to wade through um, and try and make sense of into a coherent storyline. And I'll get into that being a, a, a large challenge towards the end of the discussion. But the initial brief um, was to really bring that down to six minutes and we realized it wasn't going to be possible. So we ended up with a nine minute movie. Um, and yeah, the, the, the really the process was to, to look at the interview and to try and create a storyline from that. And it, it involved um, a, a lot of, of, of editing and tight editing. Um, but there was a lot of additional information over and above the three hours of footage that um, created what we call in, in editing terminology, B-roll footage. So that is the footage that we overlay, we superimpose over the interview, which is the, the core primary timeline of footage. And we overlay um, the story with very rich material, both video footage, 
still footage, document, uh, documents, etc. Um, and that not only creates a richer experience for the viewer, but it also provides me, the editor, with an opportunity to sort of layer over the tight and potentially messy editing that, that can go under weaving together the storyline. So there were a lot of inputs that I used to create that what we call B-roll. The first was um, the original documentation that we managed, or you managed to source from the Prusa family. Um, and it was unbelievably humbling for me to, to have received this original document, documentation. Now, over the years, um, as a, a girl at school or within my family, we, we've been so exposed to the Holocaust. But to get original documentation, um, legal documents, letters of permission, um, actual names of people that were under investigation in my inbox or on my hard drive was, it was quite chilling and humbling actually. And it, it was really, it was a very special experience for me to be so tangibly involved in, in the Holocaust on, on that level. So that was quite something for me. Then um, our other um, source material was from the United States um, Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, I approached them to send over footage and unfortunately it was over the COVID period so it brought quite a lot of challenges to try and get response but eventually we got beautiful uh, video footage from that time period which was which you saw in the movie was in, was, in, was really very rich and informative and, and it gave a lot to the actual movie. Um, there was also footage from Yad Vashem and the internet, you know, little things like at the end we ended off with the, the medal of the righteous amongst the nation and an image of Kalmeya. All of that was, was researched and, and got from either Yad Vashem or, or the internet itself. Then in terms of, of the process, there were other creative elements that, that were brought into the editing process. The first is uh, sound effects, which might just have happened in your experience, but a lot of thought goes into that. Uh, there was things like uh, typewriters and sounds of bombs and trains and factory environment uh, sound effects, hammers, wheelbarrows. All of that are just little details that really create you know, a, a very effective um, experience of the actual story. It brings it to life, so to speak. And then of course the music, which is really critical in, in adding to the drama. Um, the center has um, a wonderful list of, of music that you have rights to. And um, I was fortunate to have played around and seen you know, what would work and what would really be appropriate to add to the mood of, of the film. And then I think something that really touched me and was quite a pivotal part of the creative process of the production was top and tailing um, the, 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 the movie with the close-up of, of, of Yarp himself. And it happened by default. Um, I actually, on a personal level, have a love for art and drawing, um, and in particular of, of portrait drawing. And, and uh, it was quite incredible for me during the course of this process to see the similarity of portrait making and, and documentary making, because it's really just an analysis of, of a person and getting in touch with a detailed description of a person. Every line, every, you know, the, the shape of the eye and the expression of the mouth really paints the gestalt of, of the persona of the person. And by default, I think Sean, who was videoing at the time, zoomed into Yarp's face and zoomed out really just to test the, the camera precision. And it was like a little gem that I found because I think it really, brought the viewer close to, to Yarp. And really we, we had such an appreciate, appreciation of the beautiful and sensitive soul that, that he was by really getting up close to, to his face and, and his beautiful image. So that's really in a nutshell, the process and the creative um, intentions behind the video making. No, you, you really created a, a beautiful short film and, and that close up of Yap in black and white, uh, as I said, it was taken only two years before he passed away. Uh, and for all of you that watched the movie, just imagine he was 21 years old, 21 years old attorney that saved you know, the lives of so many Jews. And he was recognized for 222, but there are, there's no doubt that there were many, many, many more that were just not recognized. 
So that close up to the eyes, these kind eyes was really amazing for me, Pam. And, and thank you so much for doing that. Really precious. So, so maybe share with us the most challenging moments in, in the process that you just mentioned. Yeah, they were, they were challenging moments for sure. Um, just I've, I've had a glimpse at the chat. Somebody's asked um, when, when we made the film, when it was edited. It was actually edited a year ago. Um, but the interview footage, as you mentioned, was, was recorded in 2009. So it, it sort of lived in the, the archives for over 10 years. But just getting back to the challenge, as I mentioned, we had three hours of footage to play with and consolidate it into a, a, a nine minute uh, movie. And um, at that point, as you can imagine, Yark was older, he was ailing, he was frail, and um, he's, he was slow in his um, telling of the story. He was stuttering and stammering quite a lot. Um, and I think he also often got confused in, in relaying the story and articulating it. So it was really quite a challenge to play with the content and to try and get a, co a coherent storyline um, that was really under, that would be understood by the viewer. So that was the biggest challenge. Um, and it required very tight editing cuts and interweaving and I, I, I very tightly chopped and merged some of his, um, his um, articulation so that it, it actually was clear and, and concise to, to the viewer. And then what we did, and I think it was your clever idea, Tali, at the end was we created a storyboard um, which really summarized the, 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 the timeline and the story of events so that the viewer would conclude the movie with quite a clear understanding of actually what the, the movie and the story and Yarp's journey was trying to, to portray. Yeah, and I think that worked really, really well because it is a bit of a, a difficult story to follow with uh, yeah. pretending not to be Jewish and the Portuguese and Spanish descent and uh, that, that he, whole yeah and he used and he used that loop loophole uh, you know we didn't include him in the film but uh, maybe I'll share a story I had the honor to to speak to him many many times and of course to interview him and one of his stories that we just didn't manage to put in the film was that he created a forged stamp baptismal stamp. Uh, it was totally forged. It was of wax. He used to baptize people as if they are not, they're not Jewish. And the Germans so respected that stamp that was, of course, forged, that whenever they saw a baptismal certificate without his forged stamp, they were suspicious because they believed that his, you know, certificates with his forged stamp were the real ones. I mean, that is the ultimate chutzpah of someone, you know, to 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 create such a, 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 a such a, a story. Um, but Yap's story has a meaning, a personal meaning to you, uh, Pam. Maybe share with us uh, uh, a little bit more about you and and your family and your connection. Thanks, Tali. So um, when I started going through the footage, Yap it suddenly just struck me that Yarp reminded me incredibly of, of my uncle, my late uncle, Hank Lantemans. Um, he was married, it was a Dutch man that married my, my mom's uh, sister. And uh, he even spoke the same, the way he pronounced a lot of the wording. And he had this corduroy jacket that my uncle had as well, which was quite remarkable. But Hank's parents, uh, Carl and Hilda Lantemans, uh, were re actually recognized uh, by Yad Vashem as the righteous amongst the nation. And I think, Tali, you were actually at the award ceremony. And we, were, we were there that day. We must have met. It was destined. <laughs> um, but uh, they were from Holland, and they had three children. Um, they lived in Stadskanal in the northern pro province of, of Groningen. And um, they were actually approached by underground workers to hide two Jews in their home. Um, the one was a businessman, his name was Hartof Kohn, and he actually lived with them for over two years in their home. And the second was Abraham Levy, who was the, the cantor of the, the Groningen Shul. And at first, the businessman actually slept in one of the children's rooms. I think one of the kids were relegated to the hall, the hallway of the house. And then um, when the cantor joined, they actually created a, a room underneath the house and uh, that would be able to big enough um, be, be big enough to to fit, you know, house the two the two men, and they covered the entrance with a cabinet. Um, 
And I think on one occasion, Hilda was uh, answered the door and the police actually arrived at the house. And um, they said, you know, there's rumor you housing Jews in your home. And she turned and she looked at her home and she said, look at my house. It's small. I've got three children. How could I possibly house Jews in my home? And thank God they, they turned around and they walked away because apparently the cantor and the businessman had actually left Jewish regalia and books lying around and, and, and they would have been intercepted. So it was just such a remarkable story that. Um, years later, they actually both survived. And years later, my uncle Hank and my, my aunt Bernice, they traveled to Israel and actually met up with the families and, and the descendants and the legacy. And it's a beautiful story that um, they saved, you know, Jewish lives and, and there's a legacy that lives on to Absolutely, absolutely. And I think someone from the family, I saw that Sean. Uh, I think Sean know, is online. Actually. Is wonderful. online. So Sean, I mean, <laughs> we are celebrating, of course, your family and, and, and their courageous, courageous deeds. Um, Pam, you know, Yap told me when I asked him, why uh, did you do it? Uh, one day, you know, I said, yeah, why did you do it? And he looked at me as if I'm absolutely crazy. And he said, what do you mean? If you will see someone drowning in the sea, surely you will jump and save that man. And I didn't have the heart to say to him that I'm a really bad swimmer and probably will not jump. But for him, it was clear that everyone would do it. What he did, everyone will do. Uh, based on your interaction, uh, you had with the story of Yap and uh, with this, with, with your family story as well. Would you say a rescuer or upstander has a special, have special qualities? Do you think everyone could have done it? Could you have done it? You know, what are some of the reflections that you had uh, after listening uh, uh, to this story and making this story uh, into a film? I think it's a difficult question and an interesting one. And I, 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 think, I, I'd, I think there might be a combination of, of an element of a learned behavior and something that can be fostered over time through, through modeling or, or what have you. But I really think that inherently a, a person has to have a, a deep sense and a concern for humanity. It's, it's, it's something that takes a special person to have that sort of, you know, inherent care and, and, and concern for humankind. And I believe that, that Yap did have that, he truly did. Um, he even said in the beginning of the, the film, he said, uh, I had a ripping, I had a calling, I was called to action. Um, and in the same sentence, he actually said, this was something that I learned from my father. So yes, perhaps there is a combination, but I think that there needs to be something within oneself that that would able to you know foster and and be displayed you know that kindness so yeah i'd like to believe humanity um, um has that potential that that, that can affect uh, and help people on such a, a level but yeah i think yarp really had a grave level uh, and and kindness within him that that was remarkable i mean to risk his life as you said at the age of 21 um, takes really a special kind of person and a special quality. And I'm not sure that everybody has that. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. And that's the reason uh, institutions like uh, ours uh, in, in, in the others that are here with us today, uh, the, the other Holocaust centers around the world are so important because to, to make these critical thinking connections to, to activism and to uh, uh, doing good rather than uh, standing aside and be bystanders is, yeah. is key. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, Pam, as we closing and, and going into our final uh, short part of choices in the Netherlands, what is your next film project? And hopefully with the Johannes Mega Holocaust and Genocide Center's archive, you know, big archives that we, that we have. So there are other projects on the go, but I think the special projects rely within your archives, uh, Tali, and uh, we were discussing, and I, and I have to say, I haven't looked at the movie for a year and I haven't really um, connected with the subject matter for a year. And it was so amazing revisiting this special project in, in this movie. 
it really uh, made me realize the, the importance and the wonderful sense of, of purpose and privilege that it afforded me. And I once again, thank you for that because it really was a, a very special project for me. Um, and as we discussed, um, you and I, I think it's important that we dig around in your archives and really bring more incredible people like Yop alive again and really honor and hail them in the manner that they so richly deserve. Um, they, they shouldn't lie dormant in, in your archives. I know you've mentioned there are quite a lot of righteous amongst the nations that are there that um, perhaps we can um, create some sort of compilation of righteous amongst the nation and try to find a, a common thread that binds them. Um, and you did mention perhaps including in that profiling the Lantermans family, which would be very special that I could continue and pay further honor to, to the Lantermans uh, family. And yes, as I said, all the righteous amongst the nation, such an incredible sacrifice and such bravery that, that people made uh, truly needs to be honored and held and acknowledged, not lying in your archive. So I look forward to further projects and thank you once again for such an amazing privilege and honor to work with you and together with your extraordinary material and, and, you, and your center. Thank you. And thank you, Pam. I think, uh, you know, volunteering pro bono for months on end doing this is an, an amazingly good act. And, um, and I thank you for, for creating an educational material. Uh, Glenn Timmermans asked why just 10 minutes. It just usually, a, 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 you know, a high school lesson is 35 minutes. So you can't really use long you know, material, and it's such a challenge for us because we have wonderful material, but your just under nine minutes uh, uh, film is used and can be used uh, in conjunction. I think one, with one almost feels guilty um, not exposing, you know, there was so much rich information and wonderful stories and one almost feels sad that and guilty in a way that that you hadn't exposed it that you were limited to but as you say people's attention span is uh, you have to really extract the essence and and convey a message as succinctly as possible yeah so many people want to see the film again and the film is going to be made public on our youtube channel so you will be able to watch it again it's also on our website and also this webinar is recorded and you can watch that again. So Pam, just stay with us because I'm sure people will have some questions later, but now it is my honor and privilege to invite Ndun Tuli and Rene Posniak, uh, our educators, gifted educators, to take us into uh, a glimpse of uh, choices in the Netherlands. Thank you, Tali. And thank you, Pam, for that wonderful session and unpacking the extraordinary story of Yap van Bruusdai and um, his immense bravery during and after the Holocaust. It's such an inspiration. Thank you very much. Uh, and so, as Tali said, my name is Mdun Duli, and I'm part of the education team at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And I'm joined by my colleague, Rene Posniak, and she and I and, and other members of the team also uh, work and teach uh, Holocaust and genocide um, education to many, many school groups. Uh, so this has been a very interesting um, time in our lives to, to teach. So I'm just going to share my PowerPoint, which for some reason keeps disappearing. So I'm going to do, I'm going to try and do it this way. Um, make it large. Can you see it? Yes. All right. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, choices made in the in the Netherlands, in occupied Netherlands. Of course, focusing on the story of Jaap van Bruusdai and inspired by the story of Jaap van Bruusdai. However, the way we're going to do this is to look at uh, roles, certain roles uh, that were played by certain individuals. So we're going to look at the role of the perpetrator and maybe choose one individual out of that role. And we'll look at the role of bystanders and upstanders and victims and choose one individual from each role. And sometimes doing it that way makes, uh, makes the history more understandable and more relatable. Uh, so I'm going to start with the role of the perpetrator. Let's see. 
part. Um, so there are several roles. Some roles are choices. Some roles are choices put upon you, something we call a choiceless choice. So the first role I'm going to look at is the role of the perpetrator. So what is a perpetrator? As we know, it's someone who deliberately harms or causes harm to another person. So as we stay in the Netherlands with this story, we're going to look at one individual from occupied Netherlands who was a perpetrator. This is a story that many people know about or not. Um, it might be new to some people, but we're going to look at um, uh, Albert Conrad Gemmerker. Now he was the camp commander of the Westerbork transit camp. Um, and there's a, there's a movie that was made about his life in 2019 by the Media Brothers. So perhaps some people are very familiar with his story. Um, but I'll just unpack it a little bit for those people who, who perhaps are not, are not aware of it. Uh, but just a little information about Westerbork. Westerbork is, is situated in the northeastern part of the Netherlands. And it was established in October 1939 by the Dutch government to intern Jewish refugees who had entered the Netherlands illegally. And um, in May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. And in 1942, the German security police and the SS, which was the military branch of the, of the Nazi party, they took over control of the camp. So Conrad is the man um, on the far right that is circled in red. Uh, and then from this time until September 1944, and that's the period that uh, Gemmerer uh, was the commander, the, the, the camp commander of Westerbork. Um, it served as a transit camp for Dutch Jews. And here Jews were briefly detained prior to deportation, um, to being deported to Theresienstadt ghetto or to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, as well as to Auschwitz and to Sobibor killing centers. And most of those that were deported to Auschwitz and Sobibor were killed upon arrival. Uh, these deportations happened every week, usually on a Tuesday, and a list of names uh, of people who were to be on the transport was distributed on the Monday. So under Gemmerker's uh, leadership and rule, uh, over 80,000 Jews were deported to various extermination camps. This included um, Maritz Frankenhuis, who was um, transported from, from Camp Westerbork in the Netherlands. And of course, the movie that I mentioned, it starts with, with Maritz posing questions to, to Conrad in a prison. So that's how the, the, that's a very interesting scene of the movie. After the war, um, Gemmerker um, was arrested and was imprisoned in the Netherlands. And from day one, he claimed to have no idea of the death camps, that the death camps ever existed. And out of the 107,000 Jews who were deported from the Netherlands, only 5,000 survived. Um, and after the war, he received a very, very light sentence, particularly compared to his, his colleagues from the camp. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison and he was released only after six years for good behavior. And during the trial, and even after he was released, he continued to deny um, his knowledge of what happened to the Jews after they were deported from, from, from Westerbork. Um, and then he lived as a free man in his hometown of Dusseldorf, Dusseldorf until his death at the age of 75. So some of the questions that we might ask as a way of reflecting on this particular role and this particular individual is what was his role? And uh, what were the outcomes of his actions? Was he just doing his job or was his motivation uh, beyond just an ideological uh, conviction. So if we had more time, we'd be able to make this session a bit more interactive. But those are just some of the questions that perhaps you might ponder when you think about certain perpetrators and you think, what was their motivation? I just want to share a very, very brief testimony of one of the survivors who still lives in South Africa, Donald Krauss. And he was deported um, he, uh, he came from, he was um, detained in Westerbork. And I'll just briefly read 
his his testimony. Um, I just have to minimize so that I can see it. So let me do this. So he says, you were woken up at one o'clock in the morning and the barrack leader would come in and he would read out names from a list and he would be listened to in total silence, except that as a name was called out, you would hear a cry, um, you would hear a sob. Now the names Sobibo, Auschwitz were no secrets. It was written on the train, anybody, any sane person would have believed that civilized people could do something like that. After all, it was completely illogical. Um, so that's a fascinating um, testimony. Don's testimony is absolutely fascinating. So if we had more time, we would unpack that. I just want to hand over to my colleague, Rene, who's going to look at another role and another individual who uh, occupied that particular role. So Rene, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Abdu, and good evening and good afternoon to all of you. I'm Rene Posniak, also part of the education team. So I'm gonna look at the role of bystanders um, and who were these bystanders? So I think that it's important for me to first dispel the notion that the Dutch people were major resistors who opposed the persecution of the Jews. In fact, only a very small percentage of the Dutch people participated in the resistance uh, to the Nazis. And in fact, most were bystanders. 75% of the Dutch Jews were murdered. And the, great, the, the greatest number of Jewish victims in, the West, in Western Europe. And um, if you look at the, the definition here, a person that sits on the sidelines while injustices are being perpetrated. I think that this definition seems to imply that bystanders are passive and they're indifferent to the murder of Jews. And after the war, they claimed that they were not involved in the genocide of the Jews and therefore should not be responsible. Passive implies inaction and indifference implies just a lack of concern. What could motivate this kind of behavior by a bystander? So many people I think that maybe they felt helpless. Maybe they agreed with the Nazis. Maybe they were very preoccupied with their own personal situations. There was a worry about their own families. And anti-Semitism already existed before the Nazis arrived. And it was now exacerbated by the very successful propaganda that the Nazi regime unleashed. But there's a but, a big but. It's important to note that while all these factors might have contributed to the general apathy, many Dutch people became involved in the Holocaust to varying degrees. And the, the, the so-called bystanders were not always passive and indifferent. So just to unpack quickly a little bit of repetition of what Tully said is that the Nazis invaded in May 1940, and most of the Dutch people witnessed that. Anti-Semitic decrees were imp implemented against the Jews very quickly. Jews were banned from most of, of civilian life, and Jews had to register themselves and all their assets. And by 1942, almost oh, the Jew, all Jews had to wear the yellow star. To demonstrate that being a bystander is not a neutral stance. It's interesting to look at the whole issue of the train system. The scale of the Holocaust was only possible because of the efficiency of the train system. Who was responsible for transporting 107,000 Jews to their death knowingly? There were over 100 transports. It's interesting that the Dutch government has agreed to pay compensation to survivors and their descendants for the involvement of the Deutsche Reichsbahn. The, uh, the original claim that they were bystanders has been rejected. They are now seen as collaborators. Compensation is an admission of guilt. If we look at the next slide, Mdu, here we see um, some ordinary Jews that are being deported to the Westerbork transit camp. 
And, and then after that, to their deaths in Auschwitz and Sobibor. And if you, you can see that neighbors are looking out of their windows, seem to be quite disinterested, certainly not putting up any kind of resistance. So who were the collaborators? Wherever Nazis were trying to implement the final solution, there were local willing helpers. This collaboration was critical uh, to, to commit murder on the scale. As Tully said, 50,000 Dutch volunteered for the Waffen SS and, and fought side by side with the Germans. The deportation of the 107,000 Jews was achieved with tremendous support of the Dutch police. A local Dutch Nazi movement, the NSB, was involved in running the Westerbork, Westerbork transit camp. Um, as Imdu said, we do try to, to try and get some critical um, thought or interrogation of what we've learned. And I suppose it would be interesting to ask the question of what makes people collaborate with a murderous regime? Maybe the, the personal circumstances that we spoke about or the very sophisticated propaganda influenced the choices that a lot of these people made. Um, and now I would like to go back to Mdu to look at another role. Uh, thank you, Rene. So we, we're going to look at a role that many of us are familiar with in terms of this history. Uh, so the role of the victim. Uh, of course, no one chooses to be a victim. It's an unfortunate situation to be in a situation where you're a victim. And uh, so we usually use this definition in our program. It's a person who is verbally, physically, or psychologically abused. And that's a very important word, abused, because it's not a choice to be in that situation. And so the, 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 per, the individual that we chose to be um, to speak about under this role is another survivor um, who came to live in South Africa, and that is Rita Badler, who's now uh, Rita Stevenson. Uh, so Rita was born on the 7th of November in 1939 in Rotterdam, and her family left Germany to the Netherlands around the, the late 1930s. So this is sort of like an ID card um, of her as a child, and it shows her date and where she was born. And as German Jews, so as German Jews, uh, they were detained as refugees in the newly opened Westerbork camp by the Dutch. So when they arrived, they were detained. And when she was three years old in July 1942, she left Westerbork as she came from a mixed family. So part of her family was Jewish and, and, and other parts of her family uh, were, were not Jewish. So the Nazis allowed the family to leave Westerbork for that reason. Um, and they lived under Nazi occupation and, um, and were persecuted. Rita had to wear the yellow star. However, as a mixed uh, child, they were not deported to, to their death. And after the war, she, she came to live in South Africa. And this is, an, again, another I, sort of ID card um, when she came to, to South Africa in 1948 uh, in Pretoria. Um, so this is a fascinating story because it's, number one, it's, it's a different kind of victim, but also when children are victimized, the trauma that children experience can sometimes have different layers compared to the trauma that adults experience. Because when you, when you are unable to receive the protection from your parents, as one would normally have protection of their parents, what does that do to you as a child? And when you grow up and you have your own children, how does that affect your kind of parenting when you have your own children? So there are many different kinds of trauma. It's not a comparison, but um, it, it's different. In, and they're both very, very powerful. Um, so we speak about this as well uh, when we, such stories, when we conduct our, our sessions. And um, um, I want to again hand over to, to Rene. We've already spoken a little bit about this, this role in terms of Yab van Bruzdai, um, but Ro Rene is going to unpack this role a little bit more. Thank you, Mdu. <clears throat> 
So as, as we mentioned before, um, a lot of people chose to be bystanders, actually landed up being collaborators, but we do have people, special people that made a decision to help. And uh, by, by January of 2020, uh, 5,821 Dutch individuals were recognized by Yad Vashem as righteous amongst the nations, people who have made the choice to save Jews. Yad van Krusta was one of them. And we've, we've heard his story. Um, he did live in South Africa until he passed away in 2011. And he was responsible for saving 222 Jewish lives by forging documents that um, convinced the Nazis that they were not of Jewish descent, thus saving them from deportation. When asked, why did you do it? He answered with a question of his own. Uh, if you see a drowning man, don't you want to save him? For him, this was a rhetorical question. He did this throughout the war while he was a young lawyer in Nazi-occupied Holland. He understood the risks uh, that he was taking and the possible co uh, consequences, but his choice was to be an upstander and a rescuer. Yes. Thank you, um, thank you, yeah. you. And I just love the quote. Um, yes. I think it's it's very powerful. So it, as we all know, Yad Vashem has the avenue of the righteous where uh, non-Jews who saved Jews during the Holocaust are recognized as uh, righteous among the nations. Uh, and Yad, and, and Yad van Rustai as a rescuer was recognized by Yad Vashem as Rene said in Jerusalem. And he saved, he's recognized for having saved 222 Jews in the Netherlands during the Holocaust. And of course, his quote, uh, if you see a drowning man, would you not save him? Um, it's incredible that he, when he said that, he, to him, it was rhetoric, it was a rhetorical question. Um, and it's a powerful quote and is a challenge to all of us, especially today, in today's world, in today's challenges that we are facing, challenges of many kind. Um, it challenges us to, to look beyond our, our bubble. So we're going to stop there. We're going to stop the session there uh, purely because of time. Um, uh, thank you very much, Rene. And thank you for those of you who posted questions and comments on the chat. And I'm going to hand over to Tali to moderate the session, the Q&A session. And thank you, Mdu and Rene. Um, really, in 15 minutes, you try to show uh, the many examples in the, the sort of critical thinking and exercises that you, you do when you take the film, the nine minutes film, and then unpack some of uh, those choices. And uh, um, I, I, I want to actually start with Glenn's uh, comment, which is very, very important because there's no black and white. Nothing is black and white. Uh, uh, Professor Glenn Timmermans from uh, uh, the Hong Kong uh, um, Holocaust Center teaching in, in Macau, is he, saying something very, very true. On the one hand, the Dutch has the largest number of righteous amongst the nation, almost 6,000, 5,800 uh, odd righteous amongst the nation. And for the population of 140,000 Dutch Jews, 160,000 together with mixed marriages and with uh, refugees from the Reich, it is a small population. Compared to Poland, for example, that has had 3.3 million Jews and uh, um, the number of righteous amongst the nation is larger with over 7,000, but the population was much larger. The Jewish population was much larger. So, the, the, the gray between bystander, collaborator, uh, rescuer, and, and moving from one to the other is, is very, very, it's very true. It is a complex issue. And I assure you that when we do the, the full presentation and uh, we, we work for four hours, of course, with our students, uh, there is much more discussion about that uh, gray zone. So we, we are certainly much more careful 
in, uh, in, in looking at, at that. I'm also very, uh, uh, very much want to mention a uh, few uh, other stories of righteous amongst the nation. Uh, John Gilbert is uh, looking at another uh, story, the late uh, Diet Eman, that saved many Jews in Amsterdam. Um, and you can see, uh, you can watch uh, the video uh, making choices and, and, and read about that. I see Martin van der Fien here, and that is the story of Corey Ten Boom, the, the, the amazing, amazing story. And Martin, of course, your grandfather that uh, played a role in that story. Um, and, and then others in the audience, and I'll encourage you, please do write down if you have a personal story, uh, because this is that is what we're trying to, to, to learn about. This is exactly the point that we are trying uh, to, to, to investigate and learn about those choices. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, we still have a uh, young Eric Duberman and, and, um, a, a, and um, I'm, I'm not sure, but they are doing a, a mapping of all the hiding places in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, they started with the hiding places in, in Amsterdam, but now they're increasing to looking at hiding places throughout the Netherlands. And that exercise is really, really important to look at real resistance, hiding, and, and to document those very brave stories of, uh, of, of resistance. So, so I'm just wanting to mention that because it is important to, to look at um, the subtle differences in and um, the changing roles of, of people. Um, there are questions also about, um, about the archive, about what do you do with all those hours of archives? And uh, uh, do we share it? Can people can watch it? And, and these are uh, difficult questions because a lot of those films have uh, and Pam, you can come in here because you watch the whole thing. Um, if you're not a researcher that is actually researched certain points, would you sit through three, four, five hours of interviews uh, with many stops, many tapes and so on and watch that? And Pam, I wonder what's your thoughts about what do you do with, with the archives of those testimonies? So. Um... I think what we did, Tali, is really the correct strategy. I mean, I think we've, we, we do need to pull it out and craft it and, um, you know, bring it to life and, and give it the richness that, that really makes the story, it brings it to life and, and very much alive. Um, I think going through, there is something quite special going through raw footage because you, you definitely learn more about the personality behind the interview and the person being interviewed. You know, there's a lot of nonverbal cues and um, pauses and which really uh, say a lot about a person as opposed to them just talking, but it requires an immense amount of patience. And I think if people are happy to, to sit and, and wade through hours of interviews, if, if that's, you know, what they love to do, um, why not? Why not let them sit and engage with people on that personal level and, and really learn about, you know, Today, we don't make special people like that. I think they, if you look at the leadership around, there's just, there's so, there's so few and far between. So I think to engage with people that are so special and sit with them for three hours and listen to them chat and talk and, and relay their stories, why not? Why not let people just engage and get intimate with such special people? But I think for the more impatient people, <laughs> <laughs> um, an, an, an edited movie and something a little bit more glowing and crafty with with uh, rich rich footage to support the storyline is probably uh, a more practical way of handling it. So uh, I fully agree with you, and I have good news for the audience. Uh, we have an extensive archive, and this archive is now being digitalized, and it will be uh, available to you and to the public from the fir probably 1st of September, spring day. And uh, you please follow us and you will hear all about that. And amongst the archive will be the full interviews uh, with many survivors as well as uh, Righteous Among the Nation. And please, if you do have the patience, 
please do, as, as Pam said. Um, the other way to do it is also to go to the USC Shoah Foundation. The USC Shoah Foundation has, of course, 55,000 testimonies that uh, they took uh, uh, in the 1990s mainly, but also now. And uh, they are uh, creating short clips in the eyewitness uh, um, in the eyewitness program that you can watch uh, and you can watch some of the South African survivors as well. Um, so thank you. And uh, just the last, uh, oh, I see Dinka, you are here. So Dinka Hondius, uh, Professor Dinka Hondius is the one that is mapping the, uh, um, the hiding places. Dinka, it's so great to have you and we still want to host you to, to tell us more about uh, this, uh, this project. Uh, so please tune in because that will also happen this year. Uh, and Dinka is asking, did Yap van Prusik write his own story? And that is a good question because he didn't. He gave some testimonies. The longest is our, the one that he gave ours. We have some recordings of the ceremony uh, when he got the, the Righteous Amongst the Nations Award and uh, some other ceremonies. He spoke at the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center at their opening, and we have that recording, but he never actually wrote a book. So he wrote some notes. We have quite a lot of documents and photographs but there is no book as such. He is, of course, his story, brief story is also mentioned in the Yad Vashem, Righteous Amongst the Nation um, uh, pages. And, and then I see the last uh, a, a question and then we will close is from uh, Linda uh, Jimenez Glassman, who is asking about Vestibulk uh, and about um, the fact that she did not know that Vestibulk was actually created by, by the Dutch. And uh, this is also something that uh, is due uh, discussed. Uh, you know, there are many elements of, of the history of many countries that are not known. And what we're trying to do through our exhibition, education programs and webinars such as that and films is to, to look at complexity of histories. For example, in this case of Vestibulk, that first was open um, to put uh, refugees, uh, Jewish refugees from, from uh, mainly Germany, but other Reich countries, but then uh, was taken over by the, the SS and by the, the German administration. Um, and, and from there, in those two years, it was, of course, um, uh, deportations to concentration camps and to uh, to killing centers. Uh, so, for example, Don Kraus, that was in Vestibulk in 1944, his father was uh, deported to Buchenwald, and uh, he, his sister, and his mother were deported to Ravensburg, and uh, then he was separated from them and taken to Sachsenhausen. So there were those stories, and we have few Vestibulk survivors. Uh, in, in South Africa. Um, so if there are no other questions, I think you, uh, I, I would like to thank you, to thank Pam, to thank Du and Rene for your wonderful presentation, and uh, to thank all of you for joining us tonight. The film, as I said, is available from tomorrow on our YouTube channel and our, on our educational resources. And Pam, we are looking forward to your next film. <laughs> and uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you all for, for joining us. And please join us on Sunday when we are, um, we are marking the liberation of the uh, Jewish detainees from Mauritius. So it's another unknown story of uh, the British role in deporting 1,580 uh, Jewish refugees from Germany, Austria, Poland, and, and uh, Slovakia, and Czech, Czech Republic of today um, to the island of Mauritius, where they were detained in prison for almost five years. Uh, it will be on the 15th of August at uh, 7 o'clock South African time, uh, 8 o'clock Israel time, 9 o'clock Mauritius time. Please register and please join us. It's going to be an amazing program. Good night and all the best safety and health to all of you. Bye-bye.